Thank you for joining our broadcast today. We want you to be free to hear from God, and we pray that His blessing would be on your life. We're a church that's on mission across the aisle, across the street, and around the world. We believe the gospel changes everything. God bless you.
Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see y'all here today. If you're a first-time guest, there's a little card in the pew in front of you. If you can take that little card and fill it out and turn it into the offering plate when it comes by, we would like to give you a little gift just to show you our appreciation. Well, let's take a little bit of time to say good morning to each other. So everybody go around, find someone that you haven't met before and tell them hello. Soul at the same 
Let's pray for our offering. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Um, as we sing about these gifts that you've given us, just the fact that, um, that nothing can separate us, that's how strong your love is. Because when I see my sin, um, I think there has to be something that will separate us. But I see that um, your love is so strong and so deep and so wide um, that nothing um, can separate us um, in our union together. Um, so I pray that as we see that you have given so greatly through your son, um, and through Jesus dying on the cross, I pray that we can give freely as well, um, not out of um, a requirement, um, but out of love and gratitude, and realizing that you gave freely, so so will we. Um, so I pray that your spirit will move us at this time, um, at this time of worship, um, that it can be directed towards you and not to look good or not to feel good, um, but to f pursue joy in serving and honoring and worshiping you and you alone your heavenly precious name, Jesus. Amen.
Thank you for that beautiful song, and week in and week out, you guys sing and are faithful, and we appreciate that in your grace and your mercy, and we're going to finish up the book of Philemon today, the book of Philemon. It's uh, one chapter, 25 verses, but I'll tell you what, it could be, and all of God's Word is inspired, if, if people and if churches could go through this book, now stay with me, and live what the text says, it would transform not only churches and individuals, but the whole world. Because people would be coming to a church to say, I can find forgiveness, and I can find grace, and my God is awesome, and He's mighty. So Philemon chapter 1, the last few verses of this chapter, uh, we welcome you today, and thank you for coming. If you're a guest, it is our pleasure to have you, and we're in the book of Philemon. Philemon chapter 1 verses 17 to 25. We've been talking about the reason that this book was written, and the theme of it is forgiveness. And so Paul's kind of been ramping up for Onesimus to go back and trek back to Philemon and uh, for there to be acceptance of a brother because we have a runaway slave and we have a wealthy slave owner, and uh, there's been some offenses that have taken place because uh, Onesimus has taken money, and he has run away to Rome, and he is trying to hide in the crowd, but God has orchestrated the circumstances where Paul gets to lead Philemon to the Lord in Ephesus, and he also gets to lead Onesimus to the Lord while he's chained in prison, and now we see see the beauty of how obedience can be followed in the lives of people who live surrendered to Him. So if you'll stand out of honor and respect of God's Word, and let's read this together, and here's what the text says, coming out of verse 16. We left off somewhere around here last week. We'll recap just a tad. If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay, not to mention to you, that you owe me, don't don't miss this, that you owe me even your own self besides. Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. 21, having confidence, look at this, in your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. This is what grace does. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. 23, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Jesus Christ, greets you as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers, here's the, here's the hitter, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word, for this text. It'll be a miracle if we can make it through this, this text this weekend. And for you to make application in our lives. For us to move under the umbrella of your authority and to do what your word says to do. Just like Onesimus and Philemon. We're caught in a trap. Oftentimes we're caught in a trap. Uh, we're, we're caught in a situation where we have to make a decision whether we're going to do the right thing or the wrong thing. Whether we're going to give forgiveness or receive forgiveness. Whether we're going to accept a brother or reject a brother. And so now we see in Scripture, when you are center stage in a life, as you are in these two individuals, we'll see, that you begin to do what individuals can't do in their own strength but by the power and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. With your spirit, Paul says, amen. And so we trust the amen will be the amen in each of our lives today. Teach us, Lord, through your word. Open our hearts. Let us not uh, walk away from here wondering whether we should or we shouldn't. May we know through the truth of your word what to do. And our answer is yes, Before you ask us what to do, that's what obedience is. It's doing the will of God even before we're asked to do it. The answer is yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes. And so, Father, make this passage come alive in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's a story about uh, President Abraham Lincoln who one time was uh, among the troops. And there was a rebel soldier who... 
um, wasn't able to get the president's attention and wasn't able to get access to the president. And he was very frustrated. So one day when uh, President Lincoln was in a tent and he was among the troops, this rebel soldier was outside and he couldn't get access. And one day, it's a true story, uh, the uh, rebel soldier grabbed Tad, who is the president's son. And he said, to, he said to Tad, he said, I can't get to your father and I really need to talk with him. And Tad grabbed the rebel soldier by the hand, walked him right into the tent and said, here he is. And so what you have there is a picture of what Jesus does to us uh, with God the Father. He takes us by the hand and we're wanting to get access to God the Father and we get access to God the Father through Jesus the Son. So Jesus takes our hand and walks us right into the, president, uh, right into the uh, presence of the Father who is the President of the universe and He is the one that we have access to because of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul was saying to Philemon is I'm trying to walk you right into the access of the Spirit of God working in your life to where you and Philemon have reconciliation and the theme of the book is forgiveness. So keep that in mind as you look at this text today. And, and we're going to see, first of all, there's a debt that all of us owe that we cannot repay. There's a debt that all of us owe that we cannot repay. I want you to see what the Scripture says. Here's what it says. This is where we left off last week, but I want to dig a little more into verse 17. Here we go. It says, if then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. The word if is translated since. Since you count me as a partner, and the word partner is the word that comes from uh, out of verse 6 where it says that the sharing of your faith uh, may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. What he's saying in that word in verse 6 of chapter 1 is that word sharing is koinonia. But this word partner is koinine. And the word partner means a reciprocal relationship. Okay, so, so we're partners in the ministry. Each of us who have trusted Jesus as our Savior are partners in the ministry. And he says, since then you count me as a partner, and you do, Here's what he says, receive him, welcome him as you would welcome me. Welcome him, that's what the idea of the word receive means, to welcome. I remember, uh, if you've ever been to an airport, uh, it's a beautiful thing when you see people, I mean, maybe you've had a long flight and you didn't get your Southwest peanuts or, or your cookies or whatever, and you're a little cranky, so you get off the airplane, if you just take McGee Tyson over here, you got to come through this little whirly thing, you, you, you walk through this glass, and right there is where people from families that have been waiting for this person to step off the plane and get down the runway and get all the way to where they can welcome them. And, and there are people that are waiting with open arms, welcoming and, and kissing and hugging. And you can see businessmen who see their kids who are coming off the airplane or vice versa. And they make a beeline to one another because they so want to be in partnership. They so want to be in fellowship that they receive. They receive. That's the idea of the word welcome here. Now don't miss this. What Paul is saying is because because you've welcomed Jesus Christ into your life, then you now welcome everybody else into your life. You see, there are no enemies. Everybody that, that is under the umbrella of the Lord Jesus Christ accepts people and welcomes them. I remember one time when we, uh, in high school, when I went to Quito, Ecuador, and with some high school students, and we played uh, the uh, Ecuadorian national team in basketball, it was a big deal for 17 and 18 year olds to fly overseas and to uh, experience something we've never experienced before. And so we went there, and uh, as soon as we got off the plane, we thought we were going to crash several times in the air, by the way. When we get turbulence, we'd get those little pillows, and we would just do this. And people would just start crying, and we were crying as well. We would just send them into a tailspin thinking we're over the ocean, we're going to die, and all of that. But we finally made it to Quito. And when we got to Quito, they actually rolled out as we came off the plane. It's a different culture. They rolled out the red carpet, and they welcomed us. They didn't even know us. They knew us not from, from anyone, and they just knew our names, and they had little signs that had our names on it. And when we went to these people, they just hugged us and they gave us goodies and all kinds of stuff. That's the idea of what Paul's saying. Listen, he's saying, I'm in prison. I can't rattle my chains and get out of these chains. So the way that you would welcome me, I want you to welcome Paul. I want you, Onesimus, I want you to welcome Onesimus the way that you would welcome me. So that's what he's saying here. And these are no small words here in verse 17. So the idea is, watch this, we all like to think that we famously get along with everybody, don't we? 
And so the idea here is probably Philemon is saying, but I get along with everybody. And we like to think that, but the idea is he's not getting along with Onesimus because Onesimus has stolen some money. So that's the whole idea that Onesimus is going to come back to Philemon. And is Philemon going to welcome? Is he going to receive? Is he going to receive someone who's a partner in the ministry? Because now both of them have become Christians. And listen, when life change happens in a person, there is transformation that takes place. When Jesus Christ comes in, the Bible says, old things are passed away, and behold, all things are new. So you have no excuses once you become a Christian. You welcome people, you welcome people, and you continue to welcome people. And that's what Paul's saying. Will you allow the transformation that has happened on the inside be shown to a brother on the outside? Welcome. That's what he says in verse 17. Now look at what he says. These are no small words. But... If he has wronged you, and here's the text, and he has, or owes you anything, put that on my account. The idea of the word put here, okay? The idea of the word put is charge it. Charge it to me. Put, put this on my account. That's what Paul's saying. Whatever he owes you, you just put that on my account. So the idea is there's a charge there. So the idea is we can never repay the debt that we owe. That's the theme of the first three verses here, 17, 18, and 19. We can never repay what we owe. And I'll explain that in just a moment. So what Paul is saying is uh, uh, Onesimus has, has wronged you, but I'm going to say, put that on my account. Whatever he owes you, just put it on my account. Charge that to me. Where have you heard that before? It would have to do with the gospel. Put that on my account. I can remember one time the word charge here means to impute something. And I can remember when I was going to a, uh, may have shared this story, a Tennessee basketball game on free tickets. And so I was going and uh, we were... Uh, I, I know it was Denny's tickets that we were using, and I know Steve White was there, and there was a couple other guys that were, I can't remember who they were. But I decided that on that night, since I got the free tickets, that I would be generous. And so when we got there, they all lined up to get uh, Petros, you know, uh, Fritos and beans and uh, chives and sour cream and cheese and cilantro. You got the picture. So I said, and I got to the back, I was at the front and I kind of got to the back and I said, get what you want, get what you want, get what you want. My whole goal was I wanted to charge this to my account. This is a true story. And so Denny and Steve, they're kind of looking at me kind of funny and laughing a little bit like this is unusual. And, and, and I don't know who all else was there with me. but um, So they went through the line and then I said, I want a Petros. So this is a special order. I, I leave off the olives, olives. Leave off the olives. I just want it this way. And so and she said, she said it'll be forty-two fifty or fifty-five fifty or something like that. And I pulled out my wallet and I put my charge card right in front of her and she said, Sir, we don't take plastic here. So here I was. This is a true story. It was the funniest thing. I'm, I'm, I, my heart is so pure in this. I'm wanting to just say thank you for the tickets. I'll be glad to put this on my account. And then I started crawfishing backwards. I started crawfishing. And they all started laughing. And they, they only take cash. And if you know me, I don't ever have cash on me. So um, the idea, <laughs> and so Denny or Steve or somebody stepped up and just paid for it. So the idea was I wanted to put this on my account, but I couldn't cover the exp I could have on my credit card, but I couldn't cover the expenses on that day with what I put down because they didn't take plastic. So the idea is, and I want you to see this here, because we're going to expand this today. I want you to see what this means for the gospel. But if he has wronged you, and he has, or owes you anything, and he does, Put it, charge it to my account. Charge it to my account. So the idea is, if we see in verse 17, we see there's a welcoming. I want you to see the flow here. There's a welcoming. Then there's a charge. Then there's a charge. And then Paul says in verse 19, there's an IOU that he writes. In verse 19, look at the text. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay, not to mention to you, that you owe me even your own self besides. What Paul is saying is he's writing this because in Rome, what would happen if somebody was going to write a promissory note, they had to take the pen with their own hand and write it. So whoever it was that was translating this, uh, whichever scribe was translating this uh, Holy Spirit written letter, Paul took the pen with his own hand and he says, this is an IOU, I'm going to cover this 
Oh, uh, Philemon, I'm going to cover this um, with my own hand. And I'm writing this. So the idea is, he says, I'm doing that in verse 19. I'm writing this with my own hand. And we know from the book of Galatians that we think that Paul wrote some other times with his own hand because the Bible talks about Paul having an eyesight problem. And so he wrote in large letters in the book of Galatians at the end. So right here, what he's saying is, hey, there's a welcoming that should be taking place in your life, getting ready for forgiveness. Then there's a charge and put it on my account. And not only that, I'm going to be good for this note. I'm not going to do what Freeman did at the UT line and just walk away and have somebody else covered it. I'm actually going to be good for my word. So the idea is, that's exactly, watch this, we owe a debt that you and I cannot repay. There's no way we can repay the debt that we owe. Now I want to show you what the debt is that we owe. For those of us this morning, watch this, that possibly are separated from God the Father. We're all born in sin. I want you to understand this very carefully. I'm going to try to slow down enough to make this as clear as I possibly can. You see, we owe God a debt that we cannot pay. And He paid a debt that we cannot, uh, that we cannot uh, owe ourselves. So the idea is that... Um, in Christ, here's what happens. We're all born in sin. We're all enslaved to sin. We all have a debt problem, okay? And what they would do in biblical days, when you had a debt, you would go to debtor's prison. And you would, take, you would stay as long as you needed to in a debtor's prison to pay the debt back that you particularly owe. So here's the debt that we owe God. If we want to get into heaven, then God says, I've got one requirement of you. If you want to make it into heaven, I've got one requirement for you. 100% perfection. You have to be 100% perfect. That's the requirement. Because the Bible says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And the Bible says, be ye holy as I am holy. So God says to us, for those of us who owe a debt that we cannot pay and we can't repay, God says, if you want to make it into heaven, you have to be 100% perfect perfect, absolutely holy. Now, stay with me. Since we can't give God what we owe Him, then we are enslaved to our sin. Because the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. So God says, I require one thing, holiness. You can't give that to me, and we acknowledge that we can't give that to Him. So what we say is, God, we can't give you holiness because we're enslaved to our unholiness. We can't give you the very thing you've asked us, so therefore we're enslaved to that which we are. So the idea is God says, okay, I want you to give me forgiveness. I want you to give me forgiveness. And we say, God, I can't give you forgiveness because I have to be enslaved to my bitterness and my unforgiveness. God says, I want you to serve. And we say, God, I can't serve you because I can't give you what I owe you because I have to be enslaved to myself. It's really all about me. God says, I want you to be, I want you to be humble. I want you to have humility. And we say, God, I can't give you humility because I'm enslaved to my bitterness and my anger and, and, and I'm not, hum I'm not uh, humble in any way. I'm filled with pride. God, I can't give you what you're asking me. You're asking me to give you 100% perfection and God, I can't do it. So the requirement is, if you're going to make it into heaven, and I'm going to make it into heaven, God says, you got to go pay that debt off that you owe, okay? 100% perfection. Now, okay, since we know we can't pay that debt, now stay with me, since we know we can't pay that debt, then that debt requires something. And I want you to turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. No, chapter 1, verse 9. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm playing off this verse here, and I'm, I'm cross-referencing this in verse 18. Put this on my account. Paul said that to Philemon. He said, we're going to put this on my account. If he owes you anything, and he does, put it on my account. So the idea is, if we can't give God what he asks us, then there's a second thing that happens here. There's a penalty that must be paid. Watch this. Verse 9. These... These people who can't give me holiness, when I return, watch this, these shall be punished with everlasting, look at the text, destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Let's read it again. These 
shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Turn back to Philemon. When Paul says to Philemon, put this on my account, he's saying the same thing is what God the Father did with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said to God the Father, put this on my account. So we try to give God our holiness. We can't give him our holiness. We can't give him forgiveness because we have to be enslaved to our unforgiveness. For the wages of sin is death. And then he says, there's another requirement here. There's got to be an eternal penalty paid for your unholiness. That's what he's saying here. There's an eternal destruction. So if I'm going to go to debtor's prison, which they would do in Rome, then what I would have to do is it would have to, it will take me or anybody an eternity to pay off the debt in debtor's prison. So let me ask you a question. How long is eternity? How long is it? Forever. Okay, so here's what we got to understand. It will take me and you because we're enslaved to our unholiness, to pay this penalty of eternal destruction, it will take us an eternity to do it, and it never will be paid. That's what Paul's saying here, even in Thessalonians. You see this. So it's eternal destruction. So here's what we need. Now, you've got to get this. What we need is somebody who can pay an eternal penalty, but not take eternity to do it. Let me say it again. We need someone who can pay an eternal penalty, but not take eternity to do it. Who can pay an eternal penalty and not take eternity to do it? Here's his name. It's what Paul's telling Philemon in verse 18. His name is Jesus Christ. Because in a span of a few hours, on the cross of Calvary, Jesus can pay a debt that I can never pay, and He can do it in a couple of hours. And when He's finished and says, paid in full, that is mine forever. You understand that? Do you understand that Jesus paid an eternal penalty in the span of a few hours? And when you and I put our faith in Him, we now can say, Jesus, charge that to the Father. He says, God the Father, I'll take the sins of the world. I'll shoulder the sins of the world. I'll pay the sin debt that these people owe. And I won't take eternity to do it. Let me give you three big words. These are fancy theological words, but you need to understand this because it all ties in with verse 18. It's what Paul's asking Philemon to do. So here's the three words. The first word is substitution. Substitution. So the idea is, when Jesus Christ went to the cross, all of us like sheep have gone astray. We have each gone our own way, and the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. So if, we are try if we're... We owe God two things. One, we owe Him 100% holiness and perfection or righteousness. And number two, we owe Him a penalty that will take eternity to pay. God says, that's my holiness. I have to be holy. It's not that I want to be holy. It's not that I want to have the payment done. I require the payment to be done. I am holy. And so that's the requirement that you have to pay an eternal penalty. That's what 2 Thessalonians 1.9 says. And so the idea is the word substitution here. The word substitution means that Jesus took my place. He substituted. He took my place. The very thing that I should have gone to debtor's prison for, He took care of and was my substitute. And that's what the word substitution means. He gives us access to the Father because I was substituted by His life and His perfect life. Now watch this. He was perfect. He was sinless. The blood that flowed through Him was perfect, divine, human blood. And so I need a perfect sacrifice to take place on the cross. And it was Him who was my substitute. And He was your substitute. So when we should have gone to debtor's prison, Jesus says, I'm the one that's going to be your substitute. Second word here. And it's a big word. Propitiation. Propitiation. It's a big word that means this. Satisfied in the Bible. So the idea is, if we're going to put that charge on his account, then, then there's two requirements that we have here. 100% perfection, and number two, there's an eternal penalty that has to be paid. So the idea is, in Jesus Christ, uh, God took care of that eternal penalty. Um, the demand of righteousness was taken care of when Jesus Christ died on the cross, and so that 100% perfection, that satisfied God. And the second thing was that eternal penalty 
penalty that I had to pay and go to debtor's prison for was satisfied in Jesus Christ. So the two requirements were satisfied by the demand of Jesus Christ in my life. So not only was He my substitute, but now He is my propitiation. It has satisfied the demands of God who is holy. Now watch this, number three. And then is called the Bible calls this identification. The Bible calls this identification. So not only was Jesus my substitute and your substitute, not only was He by our propitiation, but now we have identification in Him because the charge was put on His account. Remember, we owe God two things. How many of you remember a T account from school? Anybody? A T account. few of you do. Okay. A T account. I'm going to put a T account up here. Here's a T account. On this side, you have debits. These are things that you owe, okay, on this side of the account. On this side of the account uh, is credit. These are things that are credited to you. These are things that are paid. So if we come to the ledger and we take this illustration that I'm using, on the debit side, we have 100% perfection. That's what we owe God on the debit side. And secondly, we owe Him an eternal penalty that has to be paid because we couldn't meet the demands of that. So we have two things on the debit side. Now, prior to coming to Jesus Christ, was there anything on the credit side? No. There was nothing on the credit side. So here's what God says. When when Jesus says, put that on my account, when Paul tells Philemon, charge this to me, do you understand the word picture of what he's saying? He's saying, I see that these people owe me two things. 100% perfection, and number two, an eternal penalty. Now I come over here to the credit side, and I see, oh, they've paid that in Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is 100% righteous, so he imputes that righteousness, watch this, over to their account, and this credit applies to this debit over here. And this eternal penalty that's over here on this side that, that nobody's paid, I see that they paid that in Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ identifies with them, and he takes care of that on this side. So the idea is, on the T account, we have identification. Because everything that we owe God, we couldn't pay. And then this side was credited to our account, so now I'm identified with Jesus Christ. Now that's verse 18. That's deep, but that's verse 18. Go back to it. But if he has wronged you, you just put your life in there. Have you wronged God? But if he has wronged you or owes you anything, Paul says, put that on my account. Put it on my account. It's called the great exchange, substitution, propitiation, and now I'm identified. Do you see what Paul's saying here? Paul's saying to Philemon, listen to me, both of you, have come to know Jesus. Both of you have understood substitution, propitiation, and identification. And now what I'm asking you to do is apply that which you are to this account over here in forgiveness. You see, the question would be this morning, who do you need to forgive? Who do you need to forgive? That would be the question. Look at the text. Paul says, I'm writing it with my own hand. You can't miss this. I will repay. Paul says, I'm good for the signature. Not to mention to you, look at this, that you owe me even your own self. You know what, Paul? It's like he didn't have to say that, but he did. He says, and by the way, you owe me because what Onesimus took from you is material. What I gave you is spiritual. What Onesimus took for you was, was, was stuff. But what I've given you is something that is eternal. And so what Paul is saying to Philemon is, listen, you really owe me a debt that you can never repay. I want to ask you a question. Who are the people that you owe this morning? Think about the people that you owe a great debt that you can never repay. That's what Paul's saying to Philemon. Think about this. Let me tell you, I'm going to tell you something that I owe a debt to. I owe a huge debt to my parents. A huge debt to my parents. They nurtured me. They loved me. Uh, They gave me money to take care of my schooling and my finances to, to help me get a good start in life. Um, there is no way, there is no way in 10,000 lifetimes I could ever repay my parents for what they did. Who do you owe this morning? Who do you owe? That's what Paul's saying. You owe me your very life. I am indebted to my wife. 
Not because she's sitting here. But because she is patient with me. She is kind with me. As scatterbrained and goofy as I am oftentimes and don't know where I'm supposed to be, when I'm supposed to be there, my calendar's over here, my mind's over here, something else is going. I got 15 plates. She is patient with me. I owe a debt I could never pay her back. In 30,000 lifetimes, I could never pay her back for the love and the grace and the mercy that she has extended to me. I could never do it. I owe her a debt. I can't repay. I owe this church a debt that I could never repay. This church has been kind to me. This church has been generous to me. There are people in this church that have stood with me, that have prayed for me, that have encouraged me, that send me notes of encouragement, and you don't know how much that means to me, and I could never repay you for all that you've done. This is a good church with good people, with a great God. And so what we have to understand is I owe a debt to this church that I could never pay. I could never repay. I owe people who mentored me in the ministry. These guys are close to retirement age now, but probably never will retire. I owe John Morgan, Emery Gadd, Buddy Fortenberry, different people in my life that took me when I was a young kid that didn't have a clue, had a lot of zeal, had a lot of energy. I owe them a debt that I could never repay them because they invested in my life and they took the time with me to teach me about ministry. And they said, Freeman, you won't learn ministry from a textbook. You'll learn ministry from doing it. Now come over here with me. Let's go to the funeral home. Let's go to the hospital. Let's go to VBS. Let's go preach. Let's do this. You watch me, and then I'm going to turn you loose, and you're going to do the very thing that you watch me do. I am in debt for the. There's no way in 50,000 lifetimes I could pay them back. Question Who are you in debt to? Do you see what Paul's saying here? He's saying, listen, how could you not forgive somebody who wronged you when you owe so much to so many people? If you think about that today, there may be some phone calls you need to make this morning. Some people that you owe a debt to that you could never repay. People that ministered to you. That's what Paul's saying. These are no small words here in the book of Philemon. There are people who have uh, been so kind and gracious. And Paul's saying, Philemon, you owe me a debt. You owe me your very life. I don't need to mention it, but then he does. I love it. He does. Now watch this. I want to ask you a question. Who are you indebted to? 20. Yes, brother. Here's what he says. Yes, brother. Let me have joy. The word joy is benefit. Let me have benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh. He's already said this before. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Oh, what are you saying? You know what Paul's saying to Philemon? Philemon, if Onesimus makes his way back to you, and I hear that you forgive him, do you know how much joy that's going to bring my heart? Do you know how much that's going to benefit the body of Christ? Do you understand the massiveness of this moment between you and Onesimus and the situation that's there? Everybody knows about it. But when he heads back to you, are you going to accept him as a brother? I'm going to tell you what. Paul's saying, as I'm in prison, I can't get these chains off of me. But what bring me the greatest joy was to hear that when he came back to you, you forgave him. You forgave him. What a beautiful text here. Refresh my heart. Look what he says. In the Lord. It's in Christ now. It's that identification. He uses the phrase two times in the same verse. Verse 20. Let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Everything that you and I will ever do in, in, in the power of Jesus Christ and His grace will be in Him, in Him, in Him, in Him. Ephesians says we have redemption from our sins. We have been identified with Him. We have a T account and we are identified with Him. And here's what I can say to you this morning. If you have applied the blood of Jesus to your heart, the Bible says, Everything that stood against you was paid in full. Now let me ask you something. When something is paid in full, how much is left on it? How much do you owe? Nothing. We owe nothing now because Jesus Christ and His grace has paid the ultimate price and it is paid in full. And that's what Paul said to Philemon, man, both of you have had the stamp of paid in full in your life. Now act like it. Live like it. Refresh my heart. What would it be like? If people in this community came into this church from all over the surrounding area, 
And they said, there's something about these people. They just refreshed my heart. There's been a transformation in their lives. So much so that I understand that they have received the forgiveness of God. And now I can receive the forgiveness of God. These people, they sing songs. They live life. They live across the aisle, across the street, around the world. They're doing things, but they're not doing it in their own power. They're doing it because the identification of Jesus Christ is in their life. Paul says, refresh me with that, Philemon. Refresh me. The idea of the word refresh is to be in a desert and be walking and be out of energy. You can't take another step. And then someone brings to you some cool water and refreshes you. That's what Paul says. Now look at this. Verse 21. By the way, we may go a little over. Having confidence. I heard that remark. Having confidence in, look at this, in your obedience. Look at the text. I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. Do you see this? Having confidence. The word confidence means encouragement. I have encouragement and I have confidence in you. Look at this. I don't have confidence in you, Philemon, uh, or in, in Onesimus. I have confidence in your obedience. The word obedience has to do with God's will, not Paul's will. Paul would give everything to see this happen. But Paul's referring to the confidence that he has in God because both people have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And now, because of that confidence, there's an obedience that we can trust there. Listen to me. Obedience is an important word here. And I want to trust this this morning, that everything that you and I will ever do after we get saved is obedience. That's what it is. It's just a step of obedience. God tells us to do something, and we do it. We take a step. It's like building a bridge. That's what obedience is. It's like building a bridge. We take one step and we obey and we put that plank down. We put another step and we obey and we put a plank down. How many times have you and I been in a position where God tells us to do something and we say, no, not going to do it. I'm going to be enslaved to my bitterness. I'm going to be enslaved to uh, my pride. I'm going to be enslaved to this over here. God, but, but God says, but I, you've already ha- applied Jesus to your account. You don't, you don't have to be enslaved anymore. So, so here's the idea. Obedience is just a step after salvation. God gives us enough light to obey. Listen, if you've never been baptized, but you've been saved, you're missing a step of obedience. You've never, you've never been baptized, but you've been saved. The Bible says the first step of obedience is baptism. And after baptism, he'll give you the next step. But if you say, but I'm not baptized, well, you go back. Here's how you do it. You go back and you take care of this step here. And then all of a sudden you say, wow, all things begin to fall into place here. I understand obedience now. Now let me give you three, three ideas in the Greek, personally, of this word obedience. If you've ever had children, have you ever told them to do something and they drag their feet on purpose? Mow the yard. I want it done by Thursday when I get home. Okay, Dad. So they drag their feet on. They're going to obey, but when you come around the cur- when you come around the curb on Friday uh, Thursday afternoon from work, guess what they're doing? They're just now heading to the garage to get the lawnmower. They're going to obey you. You said to mow the yard, Dad, but they're going to drag their feet on purpose. They're going to make sure you see them. Have you ever? Ha- oh, you you just need to turn the halo down a little bit this morning. Okay, now let me give you the second thing. So, so obedience can mean dragging your feet on purpose. Okay, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey you in a baptism, but I'm not in any hurry. See, that's not what the word obedience means, but that's one of the meanings that people take for the word obedience. Let me give you a second thing. You're going to do what you're told. I'm gonna, Dad says mow the yard, I'm going to do it. Whenever I have time, I'm going to do it. So if Dad says, have you mowed the yard, I can say, not yet, I'm dragging my feet, but Dad, I'm going to do it. So that counts as obedience. Notice the text. Here's what Paul says. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. Here's what Paul's saying. I know, Philemon, that you're not only going to just do what is is necessary here. You're going to go far beyond what's necessary. You're not going to drag your feet on purpose. You're not going to just do what you're told. You're going to do more than you're told. Let me give you an example. So we tell our kids, mow the grass. Let me give you over-obedience. Let me give you what this word means here in this text. And you say, I want the yard done by 5 o'clock on Thursday. You come around the corner, the yard's done. Not only has the yard been mowed, the yard has been edged. 
Now this would take a miracle. And the yard has been weed-eated, and the, your son or daughter has blown off all of the trimmings from the yard with the big backpack blower, and you just walk away and you say, my goodness, they have over-obeyed me. And that's exactly what this text says. <clears throat> Look at it here. Paul says, I am trusting that you are not just going to do what I've asked you to do, but the Holy Spirit is going to convict your heart. And when the Holy Spirit convicts your heart, I have confidence that you're going to go all the way. You're going to do even more. God's going to restore this relationship, and He's going to take you further than you ever want to go in this relationship. Now look at the text, 21. Paul says, I write to you knowing that you will do this. Knowing that you will do this. There's two words, and I don't say this to impress you. There's two words for the word know in Scripture. One is, I know by experience. In other words, I've done this, I can smell it, I can taste it, I experienced this, I've done it. I know I have epinosis, I have knowledge of this because I have experienced this. That's not the word Paul uses. Paul uses a word here that says, he perceives in his mind's eye. It, Onesimus, uh, uh, Philemon, I don't even need to see the experience of this happening. I know it's going to happen. I perceive this. I know by intuition that you're going to overobey. God has told me that. And so I don't have to experience. You don't have to report back to me. See, there's a difference between knowing by experience. Let me give you an illustration. Kate White's going to kill me for this one. But she was in the hospital recently. And uh, <clears throat> she's here today. <clears throat> and uh, Cody Barnhart, where's Cody? Cody's right here. Cody's been working with me and, and serving with me. One of his classes allows him to do this. And I told Cody, I said, uh, I want you to experience hospital visits with me. I want you to go with me. So I'm prepping him on things that I have learned in hospital visits, things not to say. You don't walk in and say, what you here for? You will, get, you will walk away. You don't do things like that. So I told him, you, you got to check out things beforehand. So I was trying to let him know some of the things by experience. And Kate White happened to be in that day. And uh, Kate White had gone through <clears throat> some kidney treatment. And I said, Cody, we're going to go see. And I said, all these places we're going to go see, I'm going to go in first and see if it's okay for you to come. And then they'll probably say it's okay for you to come. Well, I check in at the, we check in and find out that Kate White's in the maternity ward. Now, Kate, now listen. I mean, I've got faith, but I don't have that much faith. <clears throat> and neither does she. And I said, Lord, have mercy. And I said, uh, this is where the babies, this is where we have babies. And uh, so I told Cody, we go to this floor, first floor, we go through here, we tell them who we are, and she's way back in the back. And see, what, the point is this, not the, and, and by the way, Kate didn't have a baby, but I told Bob, I said, Abraham and Sarah said it was too late also, so you never know. You can't ever put God to the test because He might just try you and prove you that He can do whatever He wants to do in your life. <clears throat> so that's enough of that illustration. The point I was making is Cody would know this by experience. Paul's saying, <clears throat> I don't need to show you this by experience. I'm trusting that your obedience intuitionally is going to be known. I know that you love God. I know with this T account you've been identified with Him. So you're going to over-obey finally. And look at the text. Watch this. So we owe a debt we can never repay. Look at this, number two. Realize forgiveness has a wider effect than you can ever know. Look what he says in 23. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow laborers. So what Paul is saying is this forgiveness has a wider effect because you see the church met in Philemon's house. The people in Philemon's church in his house at Colossae would know about this estranged relationship. Not only that, but people, if you go to Colossians, you can read this in chapter 4. These people that were just mentioned, Epaphras, all these people, they were members of the church. They were members of the body of Christ. So listen to me. Forgiveness has nothing to do with just you and that person. It has a much wider effect. It has a ripple effect because people are watching, they're watching, they're watching, they're listening, they're watching, they're listening, they're watching. So don't ever think when you come to Jesus Christ that your life is now a private matter. It is not a private that matter. It's public in the way that God allows you to have impact and influence. Let me give you an illustration. Whatever you think about Rick Warren, you can think it. 
But John Piper was interviewing Rick Warren recently on his book, The Purpose Driven Life. And he said this, you can watch it on YouTube. He said something to this effect. He said, you know, sometimes, Rick, you're accused of hedging on your convictions when you get in the public eye, like with Larry King. And then he mentioned, you know, you were uh, given the inauguration prayer at the last two presidents, uh, the inauguration for the last two presidents. And here's what Rick Warren said. You may not know this. This is going to make this point come alive. He said, I could care less about politics. Rick Warren said it. He said, I could care less about politics. And then, and then uh, uh, John Piper said, well, do, do you even agree with the president's uh, policies on stuff? He said, I, we don't even see eye to eye on that. Here's what he said. He said, the reason I did the inauguration, this is the point. He said, I've got missionaries in every country of the world. And everybody is going to be watching the inauguration ceremony. And they're going to connect me with President Obama or whoever it is. And my hope and my prayer is that when these people get in jail, get in a tight situation, that somebody from another country, a prince, a king, a leader, is going to say, that's my pastor. And that pastor was tied to the inauguration. And there's possibly that that influence is a lot wider than you could ever think. So I thought about that. I thought Rick Warren didn't take that because he wanted to say a prayer at the inauguration. He took that and he said this with his own admission. I'm a missionary and an evangelist more than anything else. And if, I can, if I've got missionaries, and he does in his church in every country of the world, and if I can be a public figure, my life is not private. I'm a missionary. So if they can see me praying at the inauguration, do you understand what he was saying? My ministry has a wider effect than you can ever imagine. And that's what Paul saying to Philemon, this to the, by naming these people, your ministry has a much wider effect than just the church in your house. Everybody's watching you. Everybody's watching you. Question, do you think in your life that you don't impact or influence people by the decisions you make? Think about that. Think about that. Let's go to the last verse. Coming home. Paul is not a one-man band, and you can see this. Here's what the text says. Look at it here. I want you to see it. Here, here, here's, here's the third point. You can't forgive apart from the empowering grace of God. Verse 25. Here we go. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with, here it is, your spirit. Amen. Look at it again. It, the grace. That's definite article. What's that mean? Definite article means it's like saying the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ embodies grace, empowers grace, sustains grace, redeems grace, gives grace, freely gives grace. And he's saying definite article, that grace of that Lord. That's what he's saying. Look at this. Be with, look at this, your spirit. Your spirit your spirit. It's your spirit. This book, he's talking about you, 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 personal, 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 you, you. Here, he's saying your, plural, your spirit. This grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, be with your spirit. The word with, stay with me here, this is important, means to be with and among us. It means to allow the grace of God Watch this. To be active in your life. To be active in my life. To be with us. We're with one another. Matt is with me right here. I'm touching Matt right here. But at any time, Matt can get up and walk down that aisle and Matt is no longer with us. That's the width of association. The word with here is the word meta. It means let the grace, watch this, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at this. That's in your spirit. Your spirit, Philemon. Watch this. Your spirit has been touched and captured by the grace of God. And you would want this person to pay. You would want to say to this runaway slave when he comes back, I'll not forgive him. I'll not give him the time of day. You, the whole church is watching you. And Philemon could have gone to the point where he said, I'm just going to make him pay and I'm going to grind him and I'm going to grind him and I'm going to show people that I'm right. If you have that kind of attitude, you're going to show people that you know understand what forgiveness is at all. You don't make people pay. I'm going to make that person pay for the rest of their life. You are? Did Jesus have that kind of attitude? He says, let your attitude, your spirit, this spirit that's been touched by the grace of God, let it be active and operative in your life so when He comes, you can say, 
by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can accept a brother. Now, let me give you... Now, the book closes. Look, watch this. It closes. Amen. It never says if this ever happened. It never says... Go to the next page in the Bible. It doesn't start out by saying... What's the next book? Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1. Here's what it says. Hebrews chapter 1. God who... It it doesn't even refer... Nowhere else is the Onesimus ever referred to in the Bible. So you would think, well, did they or did they not? Did this reconciliation happen or did it not? We don't know except for church history. Now stay with me. This is important. And I'll close with this. Ignatius of Antioch was one of our early church fathers. And 50 years after this epistle was written um, by Paul to Philemon about this issue of forgiveness. 50 years later, Ignatius of Antioch was going to Rome and they were going to feed his body to the lions in the Colosseum. He was going to be killed. They were killing Christians as fast as they could kill him. And on his way, Ignatius of Antioch was heading to Rome. He made a stop, a pit stop, watch this, at Ephesus. Stay with me here. At Ephesus, he stopped. It would be like if Billy Graham was coming through Alcoa on his way to Pigeon Forge. And he just stopped by. He made a pit stop. We would all come by and say, oh, thank you, Billy, for your ministry. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for all that you meant. And then he'd go on his way. That's the idea. So what happened here is um, Ignatius of Antioch was on his way to Rome, but he stopped in Ephesus. And early church documents prove they were written. And Ignatius of Antioch was recording things. And he wrote his recordings before he was killed. Guess who he addressed his letters to? The bishop of the church at Ephesus whose name is Onesimus. You've got to be kidding me. Listen to me. That's what forgiveness will do for you. If, that, if forgiveness will do that for Onesimus, then what could it do for you this morning? If you just said, Lord, I forgive. I forgive because all of my charges were put on your account. What would it be like if people came to this place and experienced the forgiveness and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ? And what if we as a people just lived out one verse of Scripture and that verse of Scripture is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Because let me tell you what the rumor was in Colossae, in the church. People in the marketplace were saying, yeah, I know Philemon. Onesimus, I saw him in Rome. I saw him in Rome. He's trying to hide from you. He's trying to hide from you. I've, I've heard the rumor. He took money from you. He took everything he could from you. And Philemon, the church is watching you. And, and I don't know what's going to happen. But last time I checked, he was still running away from you. Philemon says, I beg to differ. I beg to differ because look at verse 3. Grace and peace to you. Uh, verse 2. To the beloved Aphia, Arch Archippus, our fellow soldier, to the church in your house. In your house. So where Philemon and Onesimus at one point were estranged and people were saying, I see him, we're watching, we're watching. Then somebody says, I saw him last week. I'm reading a little bit in the text here. I saw him last week. They were saying, Philemon saying, he was singing in my house. Onesimus, the church that meets in my house. That's Philemon. People are saying we're estranged, but no, 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 no. God brought reconciliation between the two of us. And actually, not only were we singing the songs of praise in my house, but we were sitting right next to each other. We were sitting right next to each other. That's what forgiveness will do. The church in your house. This whole book is a book about the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be with your spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit has captured you. Now your spirit yield to His spirit, and His spirit will produce forgiveness through you to anybody that's hurt you. Would you pray with me this morning? I don't think this message can escape anybody in this room. It's impossible. It's impossible. I wonder what your testimony is. 
I wonder who has wronged you, who has hurt you. I wonder who has talked about you. I wonder who has defamed your name, spread rumors and lies about you. You say, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to pay them back. If I get a chance, I'm going to nail them. You know what that says about you? You don't know what forgiveness is. You see, the reality is everybody in this room has had people slander, lie, talk about them, do things to them, hurt them. Every one of us in this room have been hurt by someone. But yet, if transformation by the power of the grace that's in us is really evident in our lives. We owe a whole lot of people a whole lot of debts. Every one of us in this room owe people. I just named four this morning. In my own life. You owe people in your own life. How could you not forgive? How could I not forgive? If God has done so much for me, why would I want to make somebody pay for the wrong that they did to me or the wrong they did to you? My prayer is for you and for me that this book closes with application in each of our lives. In application, please hear me. You can disagree with me, but I'm telling you the truth. Application is never what does the text mean to me. Because you can make the Word of God a cookbook. Application is this. Listen to me. Application is now that I know what God's Word says. How do I take my life that's outside the umbrella of His grace and mercy? And how do I line my life up under the grace and mercy of God? That's application. Application has nothing to do with what it means to me. It has everything to do with what it means to Him and how my life sets up with the agenda of God. Who is it that you need to let go of this morning? You know, you may be a husband and wife and you're sitting together, but you're so far from each other because there's so much water under the bridge of things of hurt and pain. Could you just say, Lord, let the grace of your spirit be stirred up within me. Do what only you can do. Maybe you're estranged from your children. Maybe you're estranged from somebody at work. Maybe you're estranged from someone in the ball field. Maybe you're estranged from someone that's sitting in this room with you. You sing the same songs, but yet there's no benefit or joy because you're still harboring bitterness, anger, resentment. Pay! Make him or her pay for what they did. Well, I'm thankful Jesus didn't have that attitude with us. He said, I'll take it all. I'll take every bit of your sin, past, present, and future. Put that charge on me. Whatever your decision is this morning, it's between you and God. But I'll tell you this, people are watching. People are watching. People are listening. People listen to what you say. They listen to what I say. Why? Because we have a wider impact. We have influence. So may the fruit of our lips, the power of the Spirit that lives in us, be a sweet fragrance, the aroma of Christ. Would you stand with me? Would you stand where you are? As we close out this book, Would you close out your account however God tells you to? As Jeff plays, would you want to come and pray? Would you want to do whatever the Holy Spirit would lead you to do? Would you let the grace that's among you, with you, in you, be operative right now? 
you need to receive Jesus, you can just come, come to me. Say, I need to settle this account right now. I'm done. However the Holy Spirit would lead you, submit to Him right now.